Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. This session is called Funding Your Master's Degree here at Columbia Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. We're excited to have you this morning and get some information out to you on how you can fund your degree. Uh, this session is being recorded. We will be sharing this session afterward, probably early next week to admitted students. Uh, so you do not need to take any notes or anything. You'll have access to both the recording as well as the presentation, uh, which has several embedded links that will be of interest to you. And so we're happy to share that. Again, it will be shared probably sometime early next week. So be on the lookout for that. In the meantime, during this session, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A and my colleagues and I will be addressing those as we go through the session. In addition, we do have a period at the end for question and answer, and we're looking forward to getting that done as well. So please feel free as we go through to put any questions you have in that Q&A. Please, uh, whoever's muting me, please try to stop doing that. Um, so today we're going to cover a few things and there's a lot of information here. So we're going to move pretty quickly through it so that we can get to this question and answer session. First, I'm going to introduce you to some of the people here at Columbia and who you would be contacting depending on what your needs are. Uh, before we get into how to fund your degree and how to uh, gather different resources together, we're going to talk about that total cost of attendance. Part of the cost of attendance is driven by your registration or enrollment category, and so I'll get into a little bit of information about that as well, just so that you have a better understanding of how tuition and fees are billed here at Columbia. And then we'll go into some detail about the different funding types that you have available to you. The one that's most popular, of course, are those fellowships and scholarships that you don't have to pay back. But for those of you who are interested in working on campus and employment opportunities, um, as well as those of you who are looking to finance your degree using loans, we'll go over the different types of aid that you have available to you, uh, as well as the steps and timing of when to do that. Now, at the very end of this session, or at the end of this presentation, there is an admitted student's financial aid kind of timeline that we've embedded. We're not going to go through that piece by piece. Much of what we cover will certainly um, outline what your steps are. But at the end of this presentation, there is uh, a bit of a timeline to give you a sense of when things will happen over the course of the spring and summer as you plan to matriculate this fall. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll have a little bit of a question and answer session at the end. But certainly as we go through the presentation, please put questions into the Q&A function and my colleagues will address those or let you know that those are going to be addressed as we go through the session. Next slide. Okay, so welcome to Columbia. Now there are a number of different offices that you will have contact with. And the first one that we wanna stress is your department. So the department that you are admitted into have a number of different people who are gonna help you navigate your education. And part of that is dependent on the department that you're in. For many of these departments, there is an, a master student program director. Now that may be the same as the director of graduate studies, depending on the size of your department, but know that within the department, there are a few different contacts that you'll have who are gonna help you to access things like research opportunities or work opportunities that are within the department. And we'll talk about those a little bit later. They also will coordinate with your academic advising, with student affairs and advising, and also um, the director of academic administration and finance within the department is the person who is going to potentially work with you if you are working in a departmental uh, job opportunity to get you paid. So these are the folks that you're going to start uh, reaching out to sooner rather than later. Now, one of the things that we have created that you might not have seen because it was just sort of made live on the site yesterday is that there is a master's departmental contact list. And this is the list um, that you should be using if you have questions about 
scholarships. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but this departmental contact list should be your first go-to during this period of time. The next office that you're gonna talk to is probably going to be financial aid, which is why you're here today. Financial aid's role is not to make the determination for scholarships. We really just facilitate um, any scholarships that are awarded by your departments to make sure that those are applied properly to your student account. Financial aid is responsible, however, for assisting you in navigating the loan process and any loans that you would like to take. So we'll go through what the timing of that is and when you should be looking that, at that a little bit later. But note that for scholarship determinations, that's done at the departmental level here at Columbia. It's not financial aid, it's not admissions. Um, so if you have questions, either you received a scholarship in your letter of admission or you're looking for scholarship um, because you didn't receive that and you're hoping to receive some, that is done at the departmental level and this MA departmental contact list that's on our website and, and linked here um, is where you're gonna wanna start. Now, outside of financial aid are the rest of the university, right? So Columbia's billing and tuition is done centrally. There are 13 different graduate schools here at Columbia, but there's one office that does the billing for tuition and that's student financial services. So you'll receive information from GSAS, um, but your billing and tuition and payment plan questions, those are all done with Student Financial Services, which is a central university office. Uh, one of the things that happens is students will reach out to Student Financial Services asking insistently about something that's really has to do with a scholarship on their account um, and not get a response or not get the appropriate response. And that's because, again, there's a little difference between financial aid, which is at the school and part of Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and student financial services, which again is the central university office that does the billing. Questions about your bill specifically, about tuition that's charged, about changes in your bill, about housing or the payment plans, that's student financial services. You can certainly reach out to your financial aid office first um, and we can help direct you, direct you to the right place, but know that there are two distinctly different offices that are going to handle um, the aid that gets applied to your account, that's financial aid, and the billing of the fees that are associated with your enrollment, that's student financial services. In addition to these sort of three primary contact points, you're also gonna have contact with student affairs, Compass, which is our career services team, diversity and inclusion, um, the Writing Center, there are a lot of resources here available to you. And so we want to first let you know that you should be reaching out to these people. They're here to help you navigate the system and help you, um, you know, find good resources and a, have a great experience as you pursue your master's degree. So now that you know who you're supposed to talk to, let's talk a little bit about the total costs. Um, as you may have experienced in undergrad, if you were here in the States, there is a total cost of attendance. The cost of attendance is created using federal guidelines, um, but there are two types of underlying costs. The direct costs, which are the things that are going to be billed to your university account. Uh, these are things like tuition and fees, health insurance, those usually are the same for all students that are in a program, but they can change based on your enrollment. We'll go through that in a minute. Health insurance can also change if you are married and have dependents. You can add those dependents to your health coverage. So your health insurance costs could be slightly different. So the direct costs, while all students would be incurring those generally and are generally all the same, they can vary slightly. The indirect costs are the ones that really have a lot more flexibility. Indirect costs are the costs that you would have for your living expenses and for other things that are not billed directly to the university. Now, if you're in university housing, it's a, an indirect cost, but it's actually directly billed. So there's a little bit of flexibility in these. There's a little bit of overlap, but the underlying idea is that you've got direct costs that everybody has that are kind of non-negotiable, and then indirect costs, which are costs that you have associated with going to school, but are not going to show up on your university bill. And this cost of attendance, as I mentioned before, 
is a guide. It's created using federal, uh, federally mandated guidelines. The cost of attendance that you'll see right now has uh, information and data from the 2023-24 academic year. We're actually right in the budgeting transition for all of this. So the end of this month, early April, you should see these items being updated on our website as we get approval from the central budget offices. Um, but for those of you who are kind of first time financing your education, which is many of you, um, this is sort of this overall guiding way to figure out what you're going to need in order to cover the costs of school. And again, this little website here right now has the 2324 information um, that will be updated, but it will give you a sense of what these costs are and what they were for this last year. Generally speaking, these costs would increase somewhere between four to seven percent. Some things like health insurance can increase significantly more than that, but it's a pretty good guide by looking at what was here last year, what you can expect for the coming year. And when you get to this cost of attendance page, you'll see a breakdown. There will be a breakdown that says tuition for PhD programs. You can disregard that. Tuition for master's programs. So here in at Columbia, um, some of the master's programs have different tuition rates and the way that you enroll will also drive your tuition. So if you can see on the right, again, these are the 23-24 um, tuition figures, but what you'll see here is you've got three, four different rates for tuition, right? And it's based on this registration category or enrollment category of a residence unit, a half residence unit, a quarter residence unit. Um, so what, what are we doing here, Kate? For this program, for your master's degree program, you need two full residence units, right? So a residence unit is one, a half residence unit is half, 0.5, quarter residence unit is a quarter, 0.25, right? All of your enrollment semesters need to add up to two full residence units for the degree. So it does give you some flexibility to sort of maybe extend the program out. And we'll talk about why you might do that, why you might not. Um, again, tuition generally increases every year. So the longer you take to, to do the program, the more overall cost you would have. But if you're trying to manage your costs within each semester for affordability purposes, um, then within that semester, there are opportunities to sort of change your enrollment category in order to um, spread the program out. Now, the three that you're really gonna be paying attention to right now are a residence unit, which is a full residence unit, a half residence unit, or a quarter residence unit. This extended residence that you see that students are like, wow, why wouldn't I take that? Because it's less expensive than a half residence unit, but you know, no. The extended residence is if you have already completed the two full RUs, but are still completing your degree requirements, that's when you use the extended residence. Otherwise, for these first two semesters that you are enrolled, fall of 2024, spring of 2025, you will either be in a full residence unit, a half residence unit, or a quarter residence unit. You won't have completed the two RUs yet, and so you would not be enrolling in extended residence. There's more information about this on the registration and enrollment categories section of our website, which is linked down at the bottom of this page. So again, the residence unit is in addition to courses. You will enroll in whichever classes interest you to pursue your degree. You will always have a residence unit or enrollment category associated with the semester, right? So there are also some restrictions based on how many courses you're going to take for your residence unit. But the residence unit, as you saw in this screen before, is what creates your tuition charge. So your tuition is gonna be driven by the enrollment category that you take each semester. What that means is that if you decide to change that enrollment category, that impacts your tuition charge and your overall cost of attendance. So if you are someone who has aid and you are looking to change your enrollment category from what you had planned, like in the fall, you fill out your loan information, you say, I'm gonna um, enroll in a full residence unit in the fall and a full residence unit in the spring and be done. And then something happens and your plan changes and you do a full residence unit in the fall, 
But in the spring, you decide you're going to do a half residence unit and extend either into next fall or into the summer. If we set up your financial aid based on an assumption of a full residence unit and the higher tuition associated with that, there is um, likely a need to change the aid that you are borrowing. Um, so be mindful of that, that that enrollment category is going to be the driver of your tuition. It's also essentially the driver of you being a student. If you do not have a residence unit, so you're not enrolled in any of the enrollment categories, but you have courses, you're not a student. The university will be like, you need to talk to your school. You're not actively enrolled. You'll have no tuition charges. Your insurance won't show up. Um, so this registration and enrollment category, I know I'm, I'm sort of harping on it a little bit, but it's because it's one of those things that's very different than many schools where you would have enrolled in courses and the number of courses maybe drove what your tuition was. Here at Columbia, it's driven by this enrollment category. So it's important that you understand that when you go to register for courses, which is gonna happen in August, um, that you also are always enrolling in this enrollment category. Right, there you go. So let's get sort of back to that cost of attendance. Now we know that the tuition is gonna be driven by whichever enrollment category I select. Um, there are other fees that might change slightly if you are also in like a half residence or a quarter residence. And we'll take another look at that more closely. But this example has assumptions. Again, these are estimates. The tuition is finalized by the university in June. We anticipate that sometime in either the end of this month or early in April, we will have estimates that are publishable on our website. Uh, but right now, the information that you're going to find out there is for the 23-24. The estimates that I'm showing you here are pretty good estimates for 24-25. Um, but not finalized yet. And actual tuition and fees are not finalized until June, which when we look at the timeline of when you're going to do financial aid applications, makes a lot more sense for you to be waiting to do some of these pieces until actual tuition has been finalized. Um, so the, the direct costs that we mentioned before, are the things that are going to be billed to your university account. So these are things you will pay Columbia directly for. Um, you're billed on a semesterly basis, again, based on your enrollment category and courses that you're taking, whether you are opting into or out of health insurance, um, whether you're in your first semester or your second or third semester, some of these fees are a little bit different. You'll notice in this breakdown, two fees that are significantly different, right? The first is health insurance. In the fall, you'll see that figure of 1898. And in the spring, it's significantly higher for $3,098. That's because for university student health insurance, for the fall semester, you are billed for September through December coverage. And in the spring, your coverage is actually going to extend through to the middle of August. So insurance coverage starts August 15th. Um, and extends to August 14th of the following year. So even if you are not enrolled in summer, if you enroll in spring and have health insurance, that coverage will um, go through to the middle of August and end August 14th. If you're not re-enrolling for the next semester, that is when your insurance coverage would end. So if you're finishing the degree in two semesters and plan to be done in the spring, um, you will still have that in current insurance coverage through next summer. The other fee that's a little bit different is this one-time document fee. That is your access to transcripts and everything for life. So you have a one-time fee up front. The rest of the costs in this example are the same in the fall and spring semester. Um, there are a couple of fees that you might have directly billed. As I mentioned before, if you're in university housing, the rent is billed to you monthly, but we don't consider it necessarily a direct cost because you could have living expenses and rent that's off campus. Um, the other thing is for our international students, you do have a $160 fee each semester for ISSO for processing visa and status updates, uh, as well as you could add dining plans or flex dollars some courses have fees associated with them, and so you may see those directly billed to your account, but primarily students are going to have these charges. Um, unless they have these other items like rent or dining plans, these are the charges that you would expect for the fall semester. Health insurance, um, 
The health services fee that you see for $702 each semester is a mandatory fee that gives you access to campus health services. Um, and, and you cannot opt out of that, including emergency campus services. The student activity fee is just that. It's a student groups and other activities on campus for students, by students. The student services and support fee is for university facilities like libraries and on-campus commuting and or computers and um, the commuting as well, because we do have some shuttle buses for between campuses. Uh, as well as the university's main career services office. So the, the tuition, the student service and support fee, the student activity fee, the health services fee, the document fee, those are all mandatory non-negotiable fees that you'll be charged. Health insurance, if you have comparable coverage, you may be able to um, opt out of that health insurance and negate that charge. And that is typically available July 15th from the health insurance office. And we'll we'll talk about that as well. Now, Kate, you told me, I'm gonna have all of these. This is a sort of total, the estimate of the direct costs, right? Um, but what if I do decide to like change and take a half, half, like this is only if I'm taking the full RU. What if I wanna do a half RU? Well, we've created this estimated billing calculator that will help you navigate through that. And again, because some of the tuition and fee charges for next year are not yet available, right now this uh, calculator has the 2324 figures, but it's a great tool for you to get a sense of how it impacts you when you change that enrollment category to take like a half-time enrollment or quarter-time enrollment. I know this little visual is, is pretty small, but it's sort of to give you the sense of what this calculator looks like. It allows you to select based on your program so that you get the correct tuition charges from that cost of attendance page, and it will define those specific rates for you. Again, you'll also be able to then select for each semester what your um, enrollment category is expected to be as well as whether you plan to be in insurance or not, and give you a handy little total at the bottom for what you should expect in terms of your direct bill. It also gives you the opportunity to input um, credits that you'll have. For example, your tuition deposit is going to be applied to the fall semester. So it's not split up, it's applied directly towards that fall semester of charges. Uh, so you will see a credit for that when you get your billing information in August. Here's like, again, to show you a little bit more detail, when you're selecting the different, re different residence unit um, or enrollment category, this calculator is going to adjust for the specific tuition and fees that are associated with that. So I encourage you, if you are planning to um, maybe structure your enrollment differently than a full residence unit, full residence unit, to take a look at this calculator now to get a sense of the difference. Again, tuition and fees generally a 4 to 7% increase. So if you took these figures and did a 4% increase over everything, you'd have a pretty good sense. We will know again in June what these are actually going to be. And once we have good estimates, a 2425 calculator will also be available on our website. Now, after you've looked at all of the direct expenses, we can go back to looking at those indirect expenses. Now, the indirect expense part of the cost of attendance may not be what you actually have as your cost. The federal government, the Department of Education requires us to create a guide of what the expected costs might be. These costs are, are created using averages across university housing for our enrolled students. Um, as well as documenting for books and supplies and transportation, those average expenses as reported by students through surveys. So these are a guide. However, they are a guide that you have to adhere to in terms of a cap. That total cost of attendance, right? Here's the indirect. Here's including the direct expenses, this total cost of $109,398, right? $109,398. Um, that's the maximum amount that you can receive in all types of financial aid. So be they scholarships, fellowships, sponsorship from an employer, loans, 
private loans, federal loans, any type of loans that you're receiving that come through the university that require the school to certify them, all of these need to fit within this $109 figure. Your expenses may be less than that. The vast majority of our students do not come close to and exceed this total cost of attendance. Um, if you do have expenses that maybe don't really fit into this, the student budget is built around intentionally a single student lifestyle, modest student lifestyle. If you are married and have dependents, um, your expenses may certainly be different than these. If you are commuting from farther away to pursue your degree, your transportation expenses may be different. But this is where you have flexibility. So we are required to create a guide and you're not able to exceed that guided amount. But absolutely, you do not have to borrow or have funds to this total cost. You need to have funds to cover all of the direct expenses that are being billed, certainly, but these indirect costs may vary for some of you. Um, so this is where you're creating your own personalized budget and figuring out what your needs are will come into play a bit more. In terms of your planning and things like that, for those of you who are looking at housing, um, our student affairs team is the contact for housing if you have questions, so you can reach out to GSAS at student affairs or GSAS-student affairs uh, at Columbia for questions about that. You can also work directly with housing if you have questions about the application process um, to be considered for housing for next year. But these, these costs, again, you have a little bit of flexibility, but there is a cap on the amount of total aid that you can receive. So now let's get into where those funds are, right? Like, what are they? Um, now, the different institutional fellowship amounts, right? <laughs> this is what this is where that departmental contact list comes in again. Um, scholarships and fellowships here at Columbia are done at the departmental level. Admissions, while you're getting your letter from admissions, perhaps that includes a scholarship, admissions is not making the determination. Financial aid is not making the determination. Financial aid and admissions cannot um, make a determination if you are appealing to get more funding um, or secure funding in the form of a scholarship. That is done at the departmental level. Uh, now, the amounts and availability of funds are definitely limited and not all departments have uh, the same kind of funding and the same types of funding. Most departments do notify you of any scholarship with your letter of admission. However, some departments do not do that and they send out scholarship information at a later time. There is some shifting that may happen over the course of the summer, um, but your takeaway here is to be in contact with your department directly. And you'll be in contact with your department directly, not just about scholarship, but about any work opportunities or other interests that you have so that you have self-identified as someone who'd like to be considered should opportunities arise throughout the semester. Now, speaking of opportunities arising throughout the semester, GSAS as a school, as well outside of departmental funds, does sometimes have other opportunities that are announced. Um, and those are announced as they become available throughout the semester. Those are often not for items that are in the cost of attendance. So for example, travel for a conference as a presenter, that could be something where GSAS has some funding opportunities. There are research matching grants. Um, so take a look at those. GSAS has an upcoming fellowship website that you probably want to take a look at because that's um, updated with things that are coming up or opportunities that we know students have either received or are eligible to receive that are coming in the future. Um, as noted for some of you in the RSVPs that many of these deadlines have already passed for the next year. Um, or are upcoming and the determination won't be made until after you're going to be arriving for the fall. That is true and the nature of how some of these internal external scho uh, scholarships and fellowships work. Uh, so again, what you're gonna be doing right now is making a plan based on the information that you have. You can change your financial plan if you are awarded additional funds at a later time. 
Um, so keeping, keeping in mind that yes, you might get scholarship or a fellowship opportunity from an internal or external award at some point after you've already borrowed loans, we can make adjustments to that aid. So keep applying, keep looking for those. Um, at the university level, the larger institutional level, there are also some scholarship opportunities that might come up. The first two, the Interschool Fellowships and the Dolores Liebman Fellowship are often questions for us. And so that's why I've chosen to include them. The Interschool Fellowships, generally that application opens in April um, with a June deadline for funding for the following fall and spring. So you have not missed that opportunity. It is forthcoming. However, these interschool fellowships are incredibly limited and incredibly specific. For example, one that has been offered in the past is for a female who is from Iowa or attended school in Iowa and plans to return to Iowa. So again, very specific, very um, and narrow. However, if you're the person who is from Iowa, who's gonna go back to Iowa, that's a great opportunity. These interschool fellowships generally are, you know, a thousand to $5,000. So they're not gonna pay your tuition, but they will help offset some of those costs. The Dolores Lieberman is a very popular fellowship in terms of us getting questions about it. I think because it's a huge award, right? It's a, it's a full tuition with a stipend um, and really covers you. However, it is incredibly uh, competitive. It is also sort of quasi Columbia administered. It's actually administered and finalists and, and recipients are selected by JP Morgan Chase, not by Columbia. All Columbia students are eligible to apply for this. Generally, the application is in December, again, for the following year. So if you are coming and planning to finish this year, this award doesn't generally work out for you. Um, if you are planning to move on to a PhD program, then this is a great award for you to consider. However, of all the applicants at Columbia, again, we have 13 graduate schools, all the Columbia applicants are pulled together and the university is permitted to submit three from all of our applicants to JP Morgan as finalists. And JP Morgan then chooses their recipients from all of their um, partner institutions. So very, very limited, nothing I would hang my hat on, but certainly an opportunity, especially if you're to continue into a PhD program or thinking about it um, to pursue. And again, it's not gonna happen until December. So be on the lookout for that. There are also some other opportunities um, through the office of the provost, as well as other institutes and centers throughout the university. So for example, um, the business schools, uh, Tamer Center, they have summer funding opportunities for social entrepreneurship or other social engagement. So take a look at those. Um, also the Weatherhead, they have some funding sometimes for specific projects that they want folks to work on. So there are funding, non-loan based funding opportunities, non-work based funding opportunities that are out there. The reality is at the graduate level, a, a lot of outside organizations want their funds to go to those folks who are getting a first degree. We all support that. Um, so there is less funding available for master's students, but it is out there. Um, and there are some ways for you to take a look at that. Some of the more commonly received external fellowships that you guys may be aware of, NSF and Fulbright, um, some of those for the deadlines. Again, the deadlines are a little bit hard to navigate if you're going to be starting already. Uh, also, another interesting place is the New York Public Library Foundation Center databases. A lot of students uh, explore that for smaller grants and other opportunities from foundations. We do have some search engine opportunities as well. Be mindful when you're using scholarship search engines that even as you, if you identify yourself as a graduate student, a lot of the results that you'll get back will still be for undergraduates. Um, so I would start with some of these other places before you use those more general search and then search sort of um, options. And then the other place where we see are, for example, affinity groups. If you were part of a sorority or fraternity as an undergrad um, or part of a community organization, some of these, even just your undergrad institution, some of these 
organizations have alumni or other um, scholarship opportunities that you might not be aware of. And I think students miss out in their sort of affiliations uh, that there may be funding that they could pursue. So take a look at that, know yourself and know what opportunities might be out there. The other type, uh, the second type of funding that we have students asking about is generally work, right? We're still trying not to have loans. We're gonna talk about loans guys, but we're still trying not to have things that we have to pay back. So for work opportunities, if you're a US citizen, permanent resident, um, we do offer federal work study. If you're not familiar with federal work study, um, it's a subsidized program where there is some funding offered to you as the student that you can then take with you to an eligible on-campus employer and that on-campus employer's funding to you. They're going to pay you through payroll, um, but it's subsidized using this federal work study funding. The base award is $3,000. We split that evenly across the fall and spring semesters. In order to be eligible, you have to complete a FAFSA. And we'll talk a little bit about the FAFSA and the timing and all of that in a minute. Um, but for federal work study, there are federal work study opportunities uh, for you. You can get an increase. The amount of federal work study that re we receive as a school is limited. Um, but generally speaking, students are able to get the work study that they need. So if you get the $3,000 award and it turns out that you need more because you're continuing to work, you can request an increase um, if you've already, again, fully utilized the first $3,000 that you still have eligibility within that $109,000 financial aid budget. Federal work study counts in there. Um, so you still have eligibility and there are funds still available. Again. The funds still available part is sort of a, a last kind of thing. As the very end of the spring semester approaches, we sometimes do get close to using all of our federal work study funds. But um, at this point, we haven't had to decline anyone for additional federal work study. Addition, in addition to federal work study, which would be on campus work, there is also opportunity to engage within your department as a teaching assistant a departmental research assistant or a reader. Readers are, again, graders kind of situation. These are coordinated with the specific faculty or within the department. Again, some of these are competitive and, and limited within the, the department. What I would encourage you to do is reach out and self-identify that you're someone who is interested in engaging in um, work within the department for some of the, especially the departmental research uh, opportunities, they don't actually start until October when faculty understand what their funding availability is and what the project is going to entail. And then they can figure out how many people they might need to work on that. So you haven't, again, missed anything, but certainly get in front of the folks in your department, connect with them to say like, I really want to engage in this. This is where my interests lie. And perhaps they'll be able to connect you with a faculty member who's looking for that type of assistance. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, GSAS has its own career services team in the form of Compass, and they are a great resource as well if you're looking both for sort of information about navigating working while you're on campus and just that getting a sense of that, but also as you plan for graduation and looking for um, either summer or postgraduate work. So take a look at those. Now, Federal work study, I'm gonna tell you one more time. Six credits, you need six credits for all the federal aid. We're gonna get into that right now. Um, so loans, we encourage you, if you are enrolling in the fall and the spring, you apply for the loans that you need for the full year. Some students want to only borrow what they need for the fall semester and then reevaluate and reapply for what they need for the spring semester, I would discourage that. I would say apply for everything that you need now. And part of that is because we can make changes to whatever you had planned for the spring. But if you forget or fall behind on doing some part or something in your situation changes and you were relying on credit-based loans, um, there's some precariousness to your ability then potentially to get the spring funding. If, however, you're not looking to take any loans for the fall semester um, and you only need to borrow for the spring because you have your own personal resources that you wanna use for the fall, 
that's a little bit different. Then absolutely we encourage you to apply only for the spring. You can do that sometime in the middle of the fall semester as you make your plan for the spring. Um, but if you're borrowing in the fall and planning to borrow in the spring, apply for all of that at once. With the federal loans, we're going to assume that. We're required in some ways to assume that. And so for federal loans, what you apply for, half of it will be applied to the fall, half of it will be applied to the spring. Again, and unless you are applying for the spring semester only and not borrowing in the fall. Um, FAFSA. You guys have heard, I'm sure you're aware, <laughs> there are all kinds of disastrous issues with the FAFSA. It doesn't matter for you though, because federal aid at the graduate level is not based on need. There are no grants. There are no scholarships. There are no non-loan based items with the exception of federal work study that are available to you as graduate students. So for those of you who've reached out indicating when will I find out my need-based award from FAFSA? I did my FAFSA. FAFSA as a graduate student results in no scholarship grant type things. Those are not available at the graduate level. Graduate-based federal aid is limited to federal work study and federal loans. Um, so if you were waiting for that award letter notification that you were used to getting as an undergraduate, that's not gonna happen. Um, you completing and submitting a FAFSA to us is only going to be used if you subsequently at some point apply for a loan or request federal work study through our loan form. Um, so if you've submitted your FAFSA, great. Nothing's going to happen. Um, right now, schools across the country do not have access to the results from FAFSA. However, we're not going to be processing anything with the FAFSA at this point anyway. It will begin to get utilized um, in May and June as we ramp up to process federal work study and loan applications. Loan applications are not going to be processed until June. So right now, March and April are kind of like a slow time. You're not, you're kind of making a plan, but there are no action steps that you need to take. And again, for the FAFSA, um, you can submit that now, the results will eventually reach us. And if you then are applying for loans or federal work study, we'll have that information um, at the time processing begins. If however, you have no intention to take federal work study and you have no intention to borrow federal loans, do not complete the FAFSA. It is not needed. Um, the other reason you might complete a FAFSA is because you're applying for an external award that requires it. Also, that's fine, obviously, even if you don't plan to borrow loans, um, but know that our office is not going to take any action with the receipt of your FAFSA um, because there's no need-based graduate school aid. Uh, so when you do do the FAFSA and you see like there's an expected family contribution that's a number, it's meaningless. That number is used when there is need-based aid and FAFSA, as you know, is used for both undergraduate and graduate students, but at the graduate level, that calculation, schools may use it for their institutional aid. Columbia GSAS does not. Um, and for federal aid, it, it doesn't indicate your inability to get any of the loan types that you have access to. It's sort of just a formality of having to complete the application. For the loans that you have access to as a graduate student, all of them begin to accrue interest from the time the funds are dispersed on the dispersed amount. So I mentioned earlier, if you take a federal loan, half of it will be applied to the fall, half of it will be applied to the spring. When the fall portion disperses to the university at the end of August, beginning of September, it gets applied directly to your university account and that portion for the fall that dispersed will then begin to accrue interest at the beginning or the end of August, beginning of September. The second half of that loan, which would come in January for the spring semester, will begin to accrue interest in January. So interest is staggered as you take the loans out, meaning, as I mentioned before, if you have resources and you wanna use those towards the fall and delay borrowing until the spring, all the better for you because that interest is going to begin accruing from whenever the funds um, come. Now, for the federal loan, 
if you, and for private loans as well, if you take out a federal loan um, with a plan, your best financial plan that you came up with, and then something changes, let's say you do get an external scholarship, and now you have an additional $5,000 that can go towards your education expenses, where maybe it's October and you got this and you borrowed loans for the full semester, you can actually reduce those loans at that point and replace it with the scholarship money, right? Reduce your debt. For federal loans, if you cancel and return any portion of the loan within 120 days from when it dispersed, so again, in the fall, that's the end of August, beginning of September, 120 days being like December, you essentially have that entire semester to change your mind and it will be as though you never borrowed that amount. A cancellation or return that's processed within 120 days of the disbursement, the fee is reversed and we'll show you what the fees are in a second. And the interest that's been accruing from the time of disbursement is backed out and reversed. So if you borrowed $10,000 and it's been accruing interest since the beginning of September and now it's November and you have $5,000 that you can return, you reach out to our office, we cancel that, create a return to your federal loan servicer. That creates a balance on your university account for the money that we sent back, which presumably you're using your scholarship to pay or other resources that initiated this return. When the funds get back to your lender, they're gonna say, oh, it's a cancellation. And now it's as though you had only borrowed 5,000 from the beginning. So this is an important piece of the management of the loan, if you have opportunities to reduce what you borrowed at some point during each semester, again, that clock, that 120 day clock will restart in January for the spring amount. But if you come into another financial resource that would allow you to reduce your loans, absolutely reach out to us. For those of you who um, borrow a private educational loan, they don't have that 120 day window of no penalty for cancellation. Um, so it may make more sense instead to cancel a future disbursement and avoid the interest accruing, which again starts at disbursement. Uh, but certainly you can make reductions to private loans as well. And we encourage you always to do that. So reach out to our office um, if you have loans and you take them because again, you got other money, you can get rid of some of that interest. So be mindful that you're making a best plan based on the information that you have now, but we recognize that that could change as you go through the semester. And there are opportunities for you to change what you have borrowed. Similarly, on the less favorable note, instead of maybe getting more money, something happens in your financial situation and you haven't borrowed. You can actually borrow federal loans at any point during your enrollment, private loans as well, um, the timing necessitates that you have to still be in the semester, enrolled, uh, but you do have an opportunity if, if something changes and you didn't borrow enough or you didn't borrow initially and now need to borrow that you can do that at some point during the semester. Reach out to our office if you have questions about borrowing and the timing and what your options are at the time that you might need that. Loans take a couple of weeks to actually process. There is nothing instant about anything that happens in Columbia, so, or the Department of Education. We all work in a giant bureaucracy that works with another giant bureaucracy. So know that if you're in need of funds, immediacy is something that's not really so, you know, accessible. <laughs> So if, if you're looking at your budget and you're seeing that, oh, I'm, I think I'm going to fall short this semester, you know, you can plan ahead a little bit, reevaluate yourself some point in the fall semester to make sure that your spring plan looks right and be in touch with our office if you have questions about that. Of course, only borrow what you need, knowing that you can make changes if you borrowed too much or too little throughout the academic year, and we're here to help facilitate that. So. First group of people, U.S. citizens, permanent residents, the loan options that you have available to you. Um, the first two, the federal direct unsubsidized loan and direct graduate plus loan are federal loans. Um, the third type of loan is a private educational loan for our international students. We're going to talk about private educational loans as well, and some of this will be similar. But for U.S. citizens and permanent residents, 
Um, by completing the FAFSA, you have applied to be considered for a direct unsubsidized loan. This federal loan has no credit check. It's simply you are eligible based on your citizenship. You are not currently in default on another federal loan, and you have not borrowed the aggregate lifetime maximum of this specific direct loan type, which is $138,500. If you have pursued an undergraduate degree and another master's degree and maybe some other professional degree, and now you're getting a third master's degree, maybe you're getting close to that limit if you use federal loans the whole time. But for the vast majority of you, if you borrowed at the undergraduate level, you still have eligible, even if you borrowed the max at the undergraduate level, you still have eligibility for the direct unsubsidized loan as a graduate student. This loan is the more favorable of the two federal loans. And so you always borrow this loan first. Again, there's no credit check. Um, and so everyone who is eligible is eligible for the same amount, provided again, that they have room in their federal budget, their student cost of attendance, as well as they haven't borrowed up to that aggregate limit. But it is capped each academic year at $20,500. There are fees associated with the graduate um, direct unsubsidized and graduate plus loans. For the direct unsubsidized loan, the fee is 1.057%. So they're going to skim off the top for $250 that would be dispersed for each semester. Again, half in the fall, half in the spring. Of that $2,250, you will get a net amount of $10,142. So they're taking some money off the top before they send the disbursement. When you go to repay that loan, you will be paying the whole $10,250. Um, the federal loans both have fixed interest rates. Currently, the fixed interest rate on a loan that is borrowed before June 30th, meaning disperses to a student account before June 30th of this year, that current interest rate is 7.05%. As of this weekend, um, the federal loan interest rates are based on the 10-year treasury bill plus a spread for the direct unsubsidized loan. That's the 10-year treasury bill plus 3.6%. So as of this weekend, um, that would put the direct unsubsidized loan at about 7.9%. So that interest rate is expected to go up. There is no way for you to secure the pre-July 1st interest rate. The interest rate on the federal loan is based on the first date that a loan can disperse. Your loans cannot disperse until 10 days before the semester begins. Um, so again, late August, early September is when those funds will first disperse. The interest rates for federal loans change every July 1st. So any loans that are happening after July 1st of 2024 and um, before July 1st of 2025 will be at whatever that post July 1st rate is. Those rates are determined in mid to late May based on the 10 year treasury bill at that time. So again, estimating right now, the direct unsub would be close to 7.9%. The graduate plus loan, which is the other type of federal loan, in terms of interest rate, it is always fixed at one percentage point higher. So currently for this year, the unsub is 7.05, the grad plus is 8.05. However, if the, grad, if the direct unsubsidized loan is 7.9 for next year, both of these loans have a cap of eight and a half percent, which means the direct grad plus would not be seven point or eight point nine. It would be capped at eight point five. Um, but we are approaching those caps and, and it will be very close to, you know, an eight and an eight and a half percent interest rate rate, most likely for these two loans. The graduate plus loan does have a credit inquiry. Now, it's not as stringent as what we'll talk about with private loans. The credit inquiry on a graduate plus loan is looking to make sure that you have no adverse credit. And by adverse credit, I mean things that are like really hard in terms of like the amounts, right? So like you have a collection that's more than 90 days to pass due. You have a lot of um, uh, a tax lien, a bankruptcy, really big ticket items. You can borrow up to that total 109 cost of attendance, less other aid that you're receiving. So again, you can't borrow against scholarships or fellowships or federal work study. These loans in combination would all be um, under that figure. And I know we are very close to the time. There's a lot of information. I want to keep going if you're able to stay with me here. 
Um, for those of you who maybe have some of those things in your credit history for the Federal Graduate Plus uh, loan, you can appeal or add an endorser if you're declined. If you are declined, you'll get that information. Um, the Grad Plus has a significant fee of 4.228% currently, and so there will be a much more significant amount deducted. Uh, we do give you, again, some tools in order to determine your borrowing needs. So know that those options are available. For private loans, private loans may be a fixed rate or a variable rate. In some cases, those interest rates could be slightly less than these federal loans. However, given that interest rates everywhere in the market are on the higher side, it's unlikely that you would get something that's significantly less expensive than the graduate direct unsubsidized or graduate plus loan. Um, most lenders have a tiering structure. So you apply directly to the lender. They determine the interest rate that you receive and the terms of the loan and you accept or decline those. While many of you may qualify for a private loan on your own, you may want to consider having a co-signer because two signatures are better than one. Just like with the other loan, you can borrow up to the cost of attendance um, unless that's limited by the lender's approval for you. And again, all of these loans are going to accrue interest from the time of disbursement on the dispersed amount. For our international students, you also have options for private loans. Um, we first encourage you to take a look at any home country loans that you may have. Um, for a Canadian student, some of your banking institutions like TD Bank and others have a credit, a student line of credit that functions in some way like a student loan and might be an option that you should consider. For other private loans, um, if you have a U.S. citizen or permanent resident who can co-sign with you, you will have some opportunities for U.S.-based private educational loans. Some of those have a co-signer release where after a certain number of payments, 24 to 36 payments, the co-signer can be released from their obligation. Others do not. I know that, for example, Discover Loans does not have a release, um, but they tend to have a relatively competitive interest rate. With Just like with the U.S. citizens, these private loans might have a fixed rate or a variable rate. Sometimes your interest rate is tied to the repayment plan that you select. So when you get an offer, take a look at what those options are. If you do not have someone who is a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident who can co-sign, you do have some no co-signer options through Prodigy Finance and Empower Financing. I would, if you are considering these loans, to take a look at those applications now. The application process can be a little bit involved and take a little bit um, longer. Columbia does not act as a co-signer and cannot act as an endorser or co-signer on any of these loan types. So you are working within your own personal networks to be approved um, and get access to these loans. We do encourage, again, international students, if you're pursuing a loan with Prodigy or Empower to start that application process in April at the latest to sort of get that ball rolling because it can take several weeks for the process to go through. If you're using a private loan in order to um, complete the financial section of your I-20 application, you do not need the loan to be certified. Generally, the approval letter from the lender is all you would need. We do not have to have moved forward in certifying the loan or have that loan set up for disbursement. The simple approval is what you would submit with your I-20. Okay, we're sort of at the end. I know there was a lot there. Um, again, there's a timeline at the end of this presentation that you'll have access to. What you should be doing now is reaching out to your department and checking online for different fellowships and opportunities. There's that departmental contact list again to reach out to who you need to within your own department. Um, you're trying right now, just before April, May come along to get a sense of what you might need to do, right? Watch for that updating billing calculator, but certainly use the existing calculator to get a sense of what your costs might be and what those changes in the um, enrollment category might result in, in terms of your tuition and fee costs, just to have a sense of what you're looking at for the fall and spring of next year. Um, for those of you who know that you're going to borrow federal loans or federal work study, you can absolutely complete the FAFSA. You can also complete the entrance counseling and master promissory note that are required for the federal loans at any time. You don't need anything from Columbia to complete all the steps for the federal loans um, that are required on the Department of Education website. If you go to our guide to requesting federal work study or loans section of our site, 
you'll see direct links to each of the entrance counseling and master promissory notes that you need based on the loan types that you're borrowing. Private loan borrowers, you will be completing directly with an, a lender of your choice. International students are encouraged to begin that process now. Domestic students, US citizens, permanent residents, don't apply yet because if you apply too early, the credit expiration or the credit inquiry will expire before the loan disperses and you'll have to start all over. So when we're telling you not to do any loan process until May and June, there are reasons why you're not doing that. In June is when we will begin to process loans for the fall at the earliest. The exception would be some of our international students. We may start some of those in May, um, but if you're concerned about your credit approval for Grad Plus, you can reach out to our office because again, that credit process isn't gonna happen till we start processing in June. Your first billing notification for fall, it's gonna come out in mid-August. It'll be due in mid to late September. If you're borrowing or you received a scholarship, institutional scholarship, it will appear as an anticipated credit. Your tuition deposit is also gonna be applied to the fall. You'll have options for a payment plan. Again, this is through student financial services, not financial aid. So if you have questions, reach out to their team, but I've linked the information there. The payment plan information won't be live for next year until sometime in July, but you can get a sense of how it's structured by looking at the information that's there now. And holds, we didn't really address this much, but you may have a hold on your account. If you attended a previous Columbia program and you have a balance on your account that created a hold, or if you're new to Columbia and have not complied with the immunization requirements, these holds stop everything. You won't be able to register. You will not be a student. You will not have access to health insurance. If you have an immunization hold, you won't be able to register. Similarly, if you register just for courses and you don't add that enrollment category, you're not really a student yet either. Um, you won't have access to campus resources or health insurance or any refunds because again, you have no tuition charges. You really are not a student until you have that enrollment category. Federal aid, every type of federal aid that I mentioned, federal work study, the direct unsubsidized loan, the direct um, graduate plus loan require a minimum of six credits of enrollment. If you are someone who's going to try and do just a quarter residence enrollment every semester and you want to use federal loans, you need to have at least six credits in that quarter residency two three credit classes essentially um, in order to qualify for federal loan. If you have four credits, you don't get federal aid whether you applied for it, um, it's a minimum requirement. So if you're looking to really stretch the program out but want to use federal loans, you have to enroll in at least six credits every semester. And all of that to say, there are a bunch of people here who really wanna help. Um, you're making a plan based on the information that you have now when your plans change, reach out. Uh, we're here to help facilitate those changes. Here is our contact information. Um, and as I mentioned before, for scholarships and fellowships, reach out to those folks in your departments. Uh, I think since we're a bit over time, we'll hold off on any Q&A, uh, but I know that my colleagues have been doing some of the Q&A here in the live session. so. Uh, it was a pleasure to host this for you guys. We're really looking forward to welcoming so many of you this fall. Uh, throughout the summer, there will be more information. This presentation along with uh, the recording are gonna be shared with you next week. So take a look at that timeline and then reach out to your departments about questions you have about engaging in work or scholarship opportunities. And a little bit later on, there will be some information about loans, but we're a bit too soon now. So be on the lookout for more updates on our website and reach out to us if you have any questions. Again, thank you so much. We're very happy to have you here uh, and we hope that you have a really great rest of your day.